Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Big Data and Social Media Analytics. Our guest speaker today is Mr. S. Mohan Kumar, co-founder and CEO at Trendwise Analytics. Mr. Mohan is a BTEC from IIT Kharagpur with close to 24 years of experience in various leadership roles at SAP and IBM. He is the former Vice President of SAP Lab Labs. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you, Mr. Mohan. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. I hope you are able to see my slides. All right. So first of all, thank you very much for taking the time to join this session on Big Data and Social Media Analytics. So um, a quick introduction to big data we'll start with, followed by uh, social media analytics, where uh, I'll also talk about some of the tools and how and what of social media analytics. Now big data, I think uh, many of you have uh, at least heard about this term, and I'm sure that is the reason for joining today's uh, session. And those who have heard about big data, like any new topic, some of them are skeptical, some think this is a hype, and some are converts, so which means they believe in it. So is it a hype or reality? Now like with any new topic, Gartner comes up with what is known as a hype cycle on an annual basis. So big data is one of the topics in this hype cycle. And if you see in 2012, it was on the left-hand side of this, uh, of this curve. And, and in 2013, it's almost peaking. And this happens with any new topic, like for example, e-commerce. There will always be a period where people get very excited. And then the topic actually kind of stabilizes. So it doesn't die down or anything like that, but it stabilizes. So that is the phase in which big data is right now. So there is a lot of buzz, a lot of people are talking about it. And over the next couple of years, it is predicted that it will stabilize and people will actually start implementing more and more production and live uh, solutions. What else is causing this buzz? According to analysts, IDC for example, the big data market is going to be about 3.2, sorry, 16 billion or rather 17 billion uh, up from 3.2 billion in 2010, which is a 40% year on year growth rate. Similarly, another study by Vicky Bond says that the market will be in the range of 50 billion by 2017. Again, a similar growth rate of about 40%. Now imagine considering that we have an overall IT growth rate in the lower single digits globally, a 40% growth rate is like manna in the zone. So there is a huge opportunity for everyone. There's a huge opportunity for the IT industry. There is a huge opportunity for the non-IT industry because they make sense out of big data. And there is a huge op opportunity for members of the IT community, developers, and so on. And as you can see, there is the job trends for Hadoop, which is a part of big data is rising like anything. 
So there's a steep curve over the last couple of years. So that is the reason it's very important all of us know about big data and that's also one of the main reasons for, for this uh, session. So what is big data? When we talk about big data, there are three things that come into play. The three V's as they call it. Volume, variety and velocity. Volume I guess is a no-brainer as the name suggests. Big data involves handling of large volume of data. And this is a relative term. Ten years ago a gigabyte would have been considered as a large volume. And therefore there is no real specific figure when it becomes big data as of now. But as of today, a thumb rule seems to be one terabyte of data. If anything in the range of one terabyte is usually considered as big data. The other factor is variety. Variety refers to primarily the unstructured part of data. So data typically when we say it is stored in tables in the form of rows and columns. But increasingly there's a large amount of data nowadays which is no longer stored in rows and columns but in the form of free text with the advent of social media and you have voice files, you have video files, all of you are familiar with YouTube. So all this is a part of the variety of the data that is increasing every day. And according to one study, 80% of the new data that is being added is of unstructured type. So that is the variety part of big data. And the third component is velocity, which is basically the rate at which the information is increasing or changing. So this is the uh, uh, third component. So these are the three Bs which are usually associated with big data. There are of course um, recently a couple of additional Bs people talk about veracity and so on, but I think these three are the key components of big data. Now just to give put things in a little bit of uh, perspective, we all talk about the data increasing, but this slide somehow puts this a little bit in perspective. What happens in a minute over the internet? As you all are aware, internet is a major source of increase in data. So this slide basically gives a quick snapshot of what happens in a minute over the internet. A few examples you can see here, there are about 300 million emails almost or 204 million to be precise that are sent across the internet. By the way, this slide is slightly dated, so that might that number might have increased. And there are several videos that are uploaded, millions of them probably, millions of photos uploaded and downloaded. So those are all unstructured data over the internet. And also according to one study, the amount of videos that crosses the internet, it seems in 2015, the amount of videos that is exchanged in one second, mind you not one minute, over the internet, it would take five years for one person to watch them. That is the amount of data that is being generated. So that is a staggering growth of information and data. And that is the, that is what all of us are trying to you know, capture and make sense out of. What are the other sources of data? There are some of them are traditional sources like your ERP systems and other systems in an enterprise. Then you have commercial aircraft that generates 3 GB of flight sensor data in one hour. And a lot of this data is not even captured, stored and analyzed because of lack of capability today. And that is where I think big data can play a big role. 
The other aspect is video data. Surveillance cameras are becoming increasingly common everywhere due to various concerns, security concerns, terrorism concerns, and so on and so forth. And this is, video files are really huge. So this is also contributing to a large amount of the data that is being generated. And then of course we have the mobile phones. So these service providers like Airtel, Vodafone, they generate a lot of data. So when, when you make a call, it is not just the information about who you're calling and how long that call is, but it is also about how that call has been traversing through which towers and so on and so forth. All that information needs to be stored in the form of what is known as CDR data. So that is again a huge contributor. So how are organizations using big data today? Some of you may be familiar with IBM supercomputer called Watson. On February 14th, Watson won a game show called Jeopardy, beating human opponents. And this supercomputer was built on big data technology. There was Hadoop underneath. And this computer was, by the way, it was not online. So it was not like it's searching for information on Google and providing response or anything like that. This was offline. The computer was fed millions of pages of information on all possible topics because this game show is like that. It can be, the question can be from any topic. And it, this computer was trained to process all that information and that is all unstructured information, unstructured data, text files. And this was trained to analyze this information, process that information, and then process the questions and then formulate the answers. And all that in split second. And this wouldn't have been possible without big data technology. So that is one very good example. And by the way, this was not just done as a research project or just for fun. This is being commercialized. It has commercial uses. And IBM has mentioned that they have signed up with a healthcare company to actually come up with a healthcare solution using Watson. So this is one very good example. But there are other examples as well where big data is either being used or there is a huge possibility to use pretty much across all industries. IT infrastructure optimization, you need to protect your network, you need to detect any intrusion that is happening. The way to do is analyze all your log files and identify if there are any anomalies. Traffic flow optimization, smart meter monitoring, fraud detection, and of course churn analysis most of you are familiar with, which is common in telecom industry. So all the data, telecom data, huge volume needs to be processed to analyze churn or predict churn and so on weather forecasting. So there are several possibilities where big data is being used and can be used. So these are some generic examples. A few more, a little more specific examples. What business problems specifically can be solved using big data? I already mentioned churn. Risk modeling is another area in financial sector. The recommendation engine is becoming very common because that involves processing a large amount of data and a lot of recursive processing is involved. Point of sale transaction, this is primarily in retail. They want to analyze the point of sale data and identify trends and so on and so forth. So these are some specific examples, ad targeting 
this is across all industries. Marketing people need to identify the targets where to send their ads. A few more cases which we are all aware of. Needless to say, the companies like Google and Yahoo are the companies which faced this problem of big data because they are the ones who actually analyze large volumes of data or they were the ones initially. And in fact, Doug Cutting, who is credited as, uh, as the father of Hadoop, which is the big data technology, technology was working for Yahoo when this happened, when Hadoop was invented. So these companies are already big time, they're using big data, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on. But there are other examples, other companies which are using big data to their benefit. UPS is an example. So UPS uses big data to track or rather process about you know 16.3 million packages per day. That's a huge amount of data. So it stores about 16 petabytes. So we are not no longer talking about terabytes, we are talking about petabytes and zettabytes these days. Similarly, Caesars Entertainment, they run casinos and so on. They are using big data for multiple purposes, starting with their managing their loyalty program to web streams, and now they are also extending this to video analytics to increase customer satisfaction. They want to see if there are if their customers their behavior using the using the video because you know casino surveillance videos are there everywhere. And some more. There are some common names like Macy's. This is a retail firm in the US. Sears. Elvis is a rental car company or car rental company. And Blue Cross, Blue Shield, again in healthcare, and so on. So there are several other examples. So this is no longer, and they are using in production, by the way. NetApp is another very good example. So this is no longer just R&D or anything like that, but many of these companies are using in real life in production. And closer home, actually some of you may not be aware, the Aadhaar project I think you all are familiar with, UI, UID project. The technology used here is based on big data and this is probably one of the biggest big data projects in the world, understandably. So that's a quick introduction from a business standpoint. Let's go quickly to the technology part of it. I'll give a couple of seconds so that the slides. So that you all can see the slides. So what is Hadoop? Hadoop is the technology behind big data. And very often big data and Hadoop are used interchangeably, so don't be surprised. And Hadoop, as I mentioned, was invented by duck cutting. And he named it after his after the toy of his infant son, I guess. So that's how the name came up, Hadoop. And that's why you see the elephant symbol everywhere wherever Hadoop comes up. So duck cutting was actually given this task by Yahoo when they were facing problems with searching through some information, large volumes of uh, you know, unstructured data, text files. So he came up with this project and it was actually uh, at that time, uh, Nutch was the project actually, that is the search engine. And then subsequently uh, they made it open source and uh, it is kind of a part of Apache now. So this is a platform to manage big data because it has several components to it. 
And if you go down to the brass tags, it's actually a bunch of APIs and libraries that are available. And it really helps in distributed computing. So that is that is the primary uh, you know uh, crux of Hadoop basically. It is used for distributed computing. The only major difference between, and again, distributed computing is probably not new, but the primary difference is that this is distributed computing in such a way that the program and the data are at the same place. So you have a cluster, and the program runs on a particular node along with the data there, compared to a distributed computing in olden days in mainframes where all the processing used to happen in one place and the data was in another place. Plus, the other big advantage is that this can run on commodity hardware. Unlike a mainframe, for example, that is very expensive, runs on very expensive hardware. In case some of you are not aware, you can run Hadoop on your laptop in a pseudo cluster mode, of course. And to set up a cluster, you need just maybe a few laptops. So that is the major advantage of Hadoop. And of course, it is since it is open source, it is the software is free. So those are the various advantages of Hadoop, and that is what Hadoop is. And there are several components within Hadoop. Again, I'll give a couple of seconds for the screen to refresh on your side. So one of the main components is HDFS, which is Hadoop Distributed File System. And then you have a paradigm called MapReduce. Now very often people confuse it with the programming language. Just a caution, this is not a programming language, it is a paradigm. It is a, some people call it as a pattern, but it's more a paradigm or a set of APIs. If you use this, you can and write your programs. Programming can be done in any of the languages. Java is the most popular one. It helps you in parallelizing the processes. So that is the main advantage of using MapReduce. So HDFS and MapReduce are the two major components of Hadoop. In addition, of course, you have a couple of other not a couple, a few other tools like HBase, which is a database, NoSQL database. And then you have what is known as a data warehouse, which is Hive. And then you have Pig, Maho, and so on. So there are several components available to, you know, to help in doing some of the other other parts, right? So that's why it is a framework. That's why it's called as a platform, because there are several other components available. So this is a quick representation of HDFS. So basically, what HDFS does is that when you have a large volume of data, let's say you have a huge file and you want to bring it into the HDFS or Hadoop, it basically, number one, splits it into smaller blocks and then distributes this across the node in such a way that there is also redundancy so that if there is any, any one particular node fails, data is not lost. So all these data redundancy and the distribution, the splitting, and all this is automatically taken care of by HDFS. So that is a main advantage. So basically it is, it is, as the name suggests, it is a distributed file system. So you have a cluster of 100 nodes. So HDFS takes care of distributing this data across these 100 nodes and, and taking care of redundancy and uh, node failure and so on. So that's a brief introduction about HDFS. What is MapReduce? So MapReduce is the way in which the, you know, a given big job is split into smaller jobs and along with the data it is sent across the nodes. 
again I'll give a couple of seconds for the slide to come up but while it is coming up the map reduce has three major components there are a few sub components at this point probably it's not required one is the mapping part which you can say is the splitting and distributing of the data in the program and then there is a shuffling part which is somewhat like a sorting and then there is the reduce part which is somewhat like aggregating that is at a very high level what what map reduce is all about so basically you have a big job which is split into smaller tasks and then spread across the nodes which facilitates parallel processing and then the whole information is aggregated so that way the processing is much much faster and scalable this becomes clearer with this example again I'll give a couple of seconds for the slide to come up this is a very common map reduce example which is called word count so what this does is you have a file which obviously has a bunch of words and you want to know how many times a given word occurs in this file again this is just a, a simple illustration of how MapReduce works so the way it works is let's assume this is a big file and each of those rows is like one piece of that big file so it is split as I mentioned HDFS splits the file into smaller chunks so the same thing happens here so let's assume it is split into three files smaller files and each of them has three words and then the mapping happens whereby each word is counted and it is given out a, a number and then the shuffling happens whereby you will see that for example where occurs twice once in the first file and then in the third file so the shuffling process is basically bringing both the bears together so that is like somewhat like sorting and then the reducing part the reduce part basically is aggregating this. so it says okay twice and so on and then the final result is provided so this is again a very simplistic way of explaining how MapReduce works it is a little more complicated than that but this is just to understand this is another view of how this whole thing works so we submit a job which is which could be a a big uh, program and then that is broken down into tasks and the cluster basically consists of name node and data nodes so when you say a Hadoop cluster it consists of somewhat like master and slaves so the name node is like the master and the data nodes are like the slaves so the job is broken into that is another way of representation thanks to Hortonworks this slide is from Hortonworks presentation this is the Hadoop ecosystem basically what are various components within Hadoop as I mentioned there were two main components but there were other tools that also I was uh, talking about so this slide gives a quick overview of what are the various components within Hadoop it is you might feel it is fairly complicated which is true there are several components so uh, no one person can probably become an expert at all of these components but each of us can decide based on our skills so MapReduce for example is a component good for programmers this is a, a, a person with developer profile would like to increase their proficiency in MapReduce whereas somebody with 
database knowledge and analytics would probably more tend towards Hive and HBase and so on. So these tools provide, like for example, Scoop is like an ETL tool. You use it to import import data. Hive is actually an interface for MapReduce. Basically, Hive is a project which is uh, developed to hide the complexity of MapReduce so that you can write queries in like SQL. So they call it HiveQL or HQL. But behind the scenes, it actually executes MapReduce. So that is Hive. And Pig is used to write a series of statements like SQL statements, it's somewhat like TLSQL, and so on. So there are other components, probably we don't have time to go into all the details, but this is a quick overview of the various components of Hadoop. This benefits of Hadoop, I think I already mentioned earlier, just to reiterate, this runs on commodity hardware, handles automatically the data replication and redundancy in case of node failure. And last but not least, Apache Hadoop is free. It's an open source. There are of course commercial versions I will touch upon very quickly. These are the commercial versions of Hadoop distribution. Just like any other open source, uh, there are commercial versions of Hadoop as well. And the most common ones are Cloudera and Hortonworks, but of late, pretty much every big vendor has their own distribution, including IBM's InfoSphere Info Begin sites. The major difference is that they come with a lot more uh, bells and whistles. So it's very easy to use these commercial versions compared to Apache Hadoop. Now, I will probably skip some of these uh, slides. Um, this shows, especially for those uh, technical folks who want to know how to get started, um, this, this few slides are put together. But in the interest of time, I will probably move forward so that we can cover the social media part as well. Um, so the, the, the main starting point to get started is hadoop.apache.org and once you go there I think it, all the information is available on how to get started, how to install and so on and so forth. So I will kind of skip these few slides so that we have some more time at the end for question and answers. So that's a quick primer about big data and Hadoop and uh, I've given you a few pointers. I'm sure um, you, know, you will be able to explore on your own now that you've got an idea what are the benefits and uh, how you can uh, utilize it and as I mentioned anybody, anybody can learn it. Oh, there is a lot of material available there. Software is free. Anybody can download on their laptop and start using it and playing around. With that, let's move into the, our second part of the presentation, which is social media analytics. Now, one of the major uses of big data is in the social media analytics space. So what is social media analytics? Why do we need it? And how do we perform social media analytics? So that is what I'm going to cover in the next few minutes with these with the following slides. So uh, as soon as the you know, your slide uh, refreshes, you will see social media analytics, as the name suggests, is nothing but the process of collecting information or data from social media. All of you are familiar today about social media. Most of you, if not all, are on Facebook, and I'm sure most of the professionals are on LinkedIn, and probably uh, many of you are on Twitter as well. So all these 
and, and then there are a bunch of others like Pinterest, Google Plus and so on and so forth. So, and people are continuously putting information on, on these uh, sites. So collecting data from these social sites and not to forget the blogs. So many of you probably are even bloggers. So there's a lot of information being put on blogs as well. So the social media analytics is nothing but collecting all this information that is available on social media and very often it is with a certain topic in, 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 in uh, mind. So you say, okay, I want information about a particular product, I want information about a particular brand, get me all that information from all these social media sites, you fetch that data and then you perform an analysis on that and try to identify some patterns, some insights and very often for businesses it is very critical. They, they get insights and then they take maybe some business decisions as well. So that is this whole process is known as social media analytics. So why is social media analytics important? I think there are several reasons. Primary reason being businesses want to know what their consumers are thinking about. What are their preferences? How do they behave? Are they happy? Are they upset? Because it's very important for every business to understand the consumer. And accordingly they can act. They can identify and maybe even get a target group for their marketing campaigns for launching their new products and also on the services side they want to identify are the consumers or are the customers happy with the services that they are providing are there any complaints very often they may not consumer may not call their call center and complain but they may vent their anguish over the web so businesses can actually find out all those cases by using social media analytics. So that is the reason why companies implement social media analytics and all, most of the companies are looking at doing this. Especially in the US, I think this is very common. Most of the companies have pretty much, they have a strategy for social media analytics. In India, it is still picking up. Most of the big companies do have social media analytics strategy but it is still not mature enough. Another very specific topic within social media analytics is the customer sentiment or the sentiment analysis. This is basically identifying what the customer is thinking about, what what is his opinion? It could be about a product, about a brand. So th that is basically known as sentiment analysis. So we uh, capture all this information about a particular brand maybe. And then this information, it could be in the form of tweets or it could be in the form of Facebook comments. They are then tagged as positive or negative based on what kind of sentiment is expressed there. And then it is quantify how many people are showing positive sentiment, how many people have shown negative sentiment. And that helps companies determine whether their product or their service is doing well, a particular brand is doing well or not, whether they have to take a corrective action. So this is known as sentiment analysis. There are a few examples that I will show you very soon. So sentiment analysis has, or rather social media analytics has a couple of uh, measures. One is the quantitative measure, which is basically, is this topic even being talked about on the web? Are there any mentions? Is there any buzz around that topic? So that is one measure. This is a little more quantitative without 
It could be positive or negative, doesn't matter. But are people even talking about it? So that is measured as you know mentions, for example. So you try to identify how many times a particular topic has been mentioned, be it on Twitter, Facebook, and so on and so forth. So you gather all the data on that topic and then uh, you know then slice and dice it. So that's what you see here in these in this chart. So that is the quantitative measure. And then you have the qualitative measure, which is, okay, there's a lot of buzz, but is it positive or is it negative? Are people talking positively about this brand, about my product, or is there a lot of negativity? And it could be sometimes neutral as well. It's not shown on the slide, but sentiment can sometimes be neutral. So that is the qualitative aspect of sentiment analysis. Here are a couple of examples of how sentiment analysis is done. Basically, a particular a particular tweet or particular maybe a statement is taken, and then that is analyzed in a couple of ways. There are a variety of ways. There are some, some very sophisticated algorithms and there are some very crude ways like a, word, a bag of words based on which you identify whether a particular tweet or a particular sentence is positive or negative. Now as you can imagine this is not very easy especially with you know English language they can be multiple ways of expressing something and it is it is definitely not easy so there are on the left hand side you see that there are a few easy or simple statements which are very easy to probably measure the sentiment something like i love i love macintosh so that's very straightforward that's a positive sentiment i hate blackberry that's a clear cut negative statement but then there are statements which are very tricky and sometimes it is very difficult to determine uh, whether it's positive or negative especially by a by a program it is very difficult and a common example i always mention is there is a statement like this vacuum cleaner really sucks now is it positive or negative because that's what a vacuum cleaner is supposed to do so that's where you know the accuracy comes into play. Now I must also mention that even the best text analytics and sentiment analytics tools in the world, the accuracy, the best we can get is about 80% because of these kind of challenges. And it can very often be improved by a little bit of manual inter intervention. It can be drastically, the accuracy can be increased. So that's a little bit about sentiment analysis. So the next section is about why do we need to do social media analytics. The three main reasons for that are marketing, customer service, and the brand reputation. So marketing is basically you use social media analytics to identify your target group to send your ads maybe, the campaigns to target your advertisements. In the customer service space, social media analytics primarily I think the sentiment part of it is used to find out are the customers unhappy with the service, are they complaining about the service. Is there a way to improve that? And a third is to make sure that a particular brand or a company's reputation is not tarnished online because it's very difficult to build a brand but very easy to break it down. So social media analytics is implemented by a large number of companies, especially the big companies, to make sure that there is no 
to, the, to rather maintain the brand reputation to make sure um, that there are uh, you know, that there's no harm to their to their brand. People are not damaging. So they take corrective action in, in time before it's too late. So a lot of these is done using the monitoring. So basically on a regular basis, data is collected from social media and a um, particular keyword or, or phrase is used and then try to identify if, if there is any, for example, if you want to do brand monitoring, try to identify are there a lot of, is there a lot of negative sentiment or people, uh, suddenly is there, a, is there a huge negative sentiment? So that is an indication that there's something wrong and so on. So basically monitoring uh, is, a, is a huge part of social media analytics. Now, how is this done? What are the tools available? I think typically many big companies especially follow a certain methodology. Again, this is not probably as mature as some of the other processes, but by and large, they go about using somewhat like this kind of a methodology. They set some business goals. It could be as simple as they want to improve the sentiment by 10% or something like that. Or it could be even more generic goals like they want to increase the sales or leads or whatever. So some of them, so some business goals are set. And then some KPIs. And then they go about gathering social media data with, with the intent of measuring these KPIs and then they use various tools and techniques to actually perform the analysis. And then they measure these KPIs. And of course, that is fed back and corrective action is taken. So that is the kind of the cycle that is uh, followed. Again, this is a, um, a very high level methodology and sometimes uh, there may be one or two steps short. So uh, that's absolutely fine, but this is somewhat like an established uh, methodology, you can say. Uh, so what are the tools that are available? There are a lot of readily available tools. Then there are some custom built. There are some custom built, which means you can actually develop your own tools, or there are also tools or services rather available, readily available. So one of these three uh, are the possibilities. And uh, you can build an application, social media analytics application using pretty much open source tools like R is a statistical tool, and then using text mining and a web UI like PHP or Java, you can actually build a custom application for doing social media analytics. So these are the three possibilities on how to do it. Readily available tools, there are a bunch of readily available tools like Cloud, Sprout, Social, Radiant 6 and so on. So these, some of them uh, need to be obviously purchased and uh, these can be used. And I think with that, I come to the end of the presentation. Um, these are some additional resources and links I've provided here. And I think most important one, especially for Hadoop is hadoop.apache.org. That's where you can start your big data journey. And uh, with that, I conclude the presentation. And I think we have about 10 minutes for question and answer. So this is the time in case there are any questions. I'll be happy to answer. Okay, I think there is a 
There are a couple of questions here. Okay, so so okay, let's uh, take the top one. Pretty much, I think I may have to go. Um, yes, so the latest question. Let me take that up. Uh, I think there were a few more at the earlier. I will try as much as possible to cover all the questions. Uh, but I'm not sure if we have that much time. So let me start with the last question asked by Rajneesh Sharma. Uh, so his question is, set KPIs is set by business or the engineering organization? Good question. This is actually by the business uh, because uh, business uh, wants to use this. Like for example, the marketing team will uh, need to set some KPIs saying the sales have to be increased or I want to generate so many leads using social media. Uh, so that's all. So the short answer is uh, business. The other question is from Simi Xavier. Analyzing huge data. How economical it is to use such huge data for insights and trends by companies? Um, yes, I think that is one of the unique selling points of big data and uh, Hadoop Simi. Uh, it is um, from the you know infrastructure and from the software point of view, it is pretty economical. I think the only challenge companies are facing these days are they don't have enough skilled people. So that is probably one of the major area where they are spending money. But otherwise, you know, as you can see, the data is freely available. It's on social media, and software by and large is open source unless you go for the commercial paid versions, again, even commercial versions like Cloudera and Hadoop, they also have an open source version, which is free, right? So from that point, and then this, all this works on commodity hardware, or you put it on cloud. Again, there is a, a slight debate over whether cloud is cheap or not, but I think to start with, cloud is always a cheaper option. So uh, net net, I think it is definitely economical, and that is the reason why a large number of companies are adopting big data. Simi again, any real example on customer sentiment? Uh, yes, I think uh, there are quite a few examples, uh, but these are mostly uh, in the US. Um, I, I did mention about uh, UPS. Um, there was a case where um, one of their customers was unhappy that their parcel did not uh, did not reach, and the person was anxiously waiting. And one of the UPS employees actually picked that up. That was a tweet, and uh, he expedited the delivery of that, and the customer was very happy. And she went and tweeted about it to uh, I think uh, twenty thousand of her followers, and then that was retweeted by eighty thousand people. So that that's the kind of impact it had. The next question is from Rajneesh Sharma and the question is big data as shown is effectively managed by Hadoop framework but then it could be managed more effectively on cloud. Yes Rajneesh, so basically where cloud comes into play is that Hadoop can be available or made available on cloud and it is actually available on cloud. So Hadoop is the framework, whereas cloud is, you can say, a way of deployment mode, you can say. So you're right, so it is a combination of both. So Hadoop on cloud could be a good way to start off, and many companies are doing that, because that way your initial cost is very low, and, and then slowly as you progress, you probably set up the on-premise version. All right, so there are some more questions. Um, Shampa Gangli says, could you give some details on video analytics? Yes, sure. So basically, um, one of the main challenges with video analytics is that the data size is huge. While it is mandated that in, in, in several places, by the way, the, the cameras are mandated uh, if, you, if you go to uh, hotels or something like that, 
it is very uh, it is mandatory that they they have uh, surveillance uh, cameras and they maintain this this data for a certain period of time but unfortunately because it occupies a huge volume um, they are never stored you know and after some time they are deleted um, and the other challenge is that there will be large volumes of data where there is actually there is no change so if there is a camera in a particular foyer maybe for two hours there is nothing happening there so even though it is capturing there is really no change so where video analytics can help is number one in, in processing those large volumes of data so you, know, you can actually scale it up build a cluster and analyze this and in addition it is increasingly becoming uh, you know popular among retailers so every retail shop has has uh, video cameras and they want to analyze how the customers are moving along each of these uh, the passages and what is the most optimal way of uh, positioning their products how should they arrange their products and so on and so forth so that is another area uh, where video analytics is uh, becoming uh, popular so Achampa, I hope that uh, answers your question uh, Suresh asks data redundancy is it replicates data in every cluster node or it has its own algorithm how it does that is only in few systems okay so Suresh it is probably a little more technical and more uh, it needs a little uh, deeper understanding but at a very high level I can tell you that yes the replication happens automatically there are some pre-configured parameters but then we can tweak that um, to, to uh, you know to strike a balance and uh, so that's that but the point is yes there are some algorithms there are uh, own algorithms that it uses but you can also modify and change that according to uh, to optimize the whole process Ganesh Akela um, I think he has left so I will not probably answer his question um, Jyoti Prakash for beginner which language is necessary for to learn Hadoop okay so typically as I mentioned um, overall to learn Hadoop you don't have to be a programmer that is uh, that is uh, the first thing but um, if you want to do some programming using MapReduce for example and if you want to develop uh, if you want to establish yourself as a developer then Java is the most common language but then again um, Python is another language and there are a bunch of if you are already familiar with a certain language then you can actually start uh, learning Hadoop so that shouldn't be a barrier but once again I would like to reiterate to learn Hadoop you don't need any programming language or any programming experience as such because there is a lot more than programming in Hadoop uh, so there is one more from Suresh Kavli um, the question is HDFS is it the data is no more using standard RDBMS structure in other words if I need to use Hadoop on RDBMS data then do I need to convert it into HDFS all right so um, I think this is a little uh, complicated uh, question um, HDFS is the file system right as the name suggests distributed file system um, whereas RDF, RDBMS is how you store your data in the form of a database so HDFS is not really a database it is just a file storage system now can we use a combination of RDBMS and HDFS yes uh, but it is these are not you know replacing each other or something like that uh, but by and large in, in big data when we talk about big data typically we don't talk about RDBMS because uh, we, we talk about what is known as NoSQL database so uh, for example with, H, with Hadoop uh, we get HBase which is a NoSQL database it doesn't follow actually RDBMS it is not RDBMS uh, they, they don't have a, a predefined schema like in RDBMS so that's the major difference but then yeah you need to learn a little bit and uh, you know uh, based on the pointers that I have provided if you uh, go through some of the material you will understand of what is this difference uh, so I, we are pretty much done. I will probably answer one last question from uh, Mohammad Shali Khan. How do you see social media analytics and general web analytics uh, data can be can be used together to get coherent 
data for a brand. Yes, so I think uh, social media analytics is um, more about what people are talking about and I think web analytics when you're talking about is more in terms of the clicks and click stream analysis and so on and so forth. Um, so the, the, I think the best way to do is you merge these two and combine these two then you can actually get a much better insight. But social media analytics per se is about the content, not really the, the clicking pattern or the, or the navigation pattern. So that is the basic difference. All right, so with that, I would uh, like to conclude my session once again. Thank you all very much. It is 6 o'clock, so um, I'd like to conclude this session, and I would like to thank you all once again, especially those who have stayed uh, till the end. And, uh, I hope uh, you will have a good starting um, point for uh, big data career. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the insightful presentation, Mohan. It was a great session. Thank you for the uh, for the questions as well. I hope our users got insights into their questions. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. Uh, I would like you all to know that the recording of this session would be available on techgeek.com on the webinar page by tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening.